Now listen to an interview with the author. You read the first Kate Chugach novel, and I'd love to hear you guys talk about that first encounter that you had as author and reader. Well, actually, what happened was she emailed me with a big, long list of words that she needed <laughs> pronounced properly and said, could we set up a time so that she could talk to me and get the pronunciation correct? And I said, of course. And this is all new to me. And of course, I was thrilled that the book was going to be recorded on audio. And so she called and she has this fabulous, you know, Burt Brown Butter voice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm listening. I'm half in love already because I'm listening to this great voice that's going to be narrating the Kate Chugach novels. And I'm astonished by how thorough she is, how careful she is about getting the pronunciation of all the words correct. Um, it had not previously occurred to me that someone could take that much time and care with the actual correct pronunciation of the names. And Alaska names can be extremely difficult, even for me, and I was born there. So I was hugely impressed by the first time we, quote, met, end quote, <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> Well, and, and it's really so important to the process to get those words. You have, I'm sure, huge numbers of fans in Alaska. And so I remember one of the first things I said was the village that Kate is from was Nanilna. And that's a hard word for me to say. Nanilna is mm -hmm. tough. And uh, I remember you saying, oh, it's a made-up village. <laughs> It's okay. But then I thought of all the places that were not made up and the people that would be listening mm -hmm. and that it was really quite important for your fan base in Alaska and elsewhere. And it's one of the things that I, I've learned so much about Alaska and, and the people there and the sort of vibrancy of, of the various cultural, the arts, and then the fishing. And that's one of the great things about the Kate Shugak series is it covers all things Alaska. Oh, I leave nothing out. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is grist for my mill, or Kate's mill, as the case may be. That's right. That's right. Obviously, as the creator of the character and as the creator of her voice, you've been working with the same character for a long time. And I'm interested to know how you each find Kate has changed over time. I think one of the most amazing things about Kate is her resilience and that she's so responsible. And I think it's the second book when we get a real sense of how responsible she feels to her community. And she's a reluctant hero, I think. She doesn't want the responsibility. She really would like her privacy. She would like to be at her homestead, and she's got mud, and the first lover, of course, Jack, and then later on we get Jim Chopin. But she wants privacy, and she's constantly banging up against the fact that she is the hero and that she keeps having to step into these situations that she, she is absolutely... Absolutely reluctant to She's forced. Do. She's forced into it. I, someone once remarked, in fact, several people have remarked about how angry she is in the very first novel. Well, she's been through a lot. Her backstory is already pretty fraught. Yes. She's given five and a half years of her life to investigating sex crimes against um, women and children in Anchorage. And she comes home gravely wounded and is healing. And it's 18 months before she takes on another case. And that pretty much, you know, is forced on her, as is her career from um, that point on. So it took her a while to really, like at the beginning of Breakup, she can't figure out what to put down is her job title on her IRS, <laughs> right. IRS statement. <laughs> right, right. And she's got her Darigold butter uh, uh, can that she keeps her dollar two ninety eight in and yes. takes a job when she knows that she needs a little money. Mm -hmm. One of the, the other things uh, about Cake, I, when you talk about her arc, I feel like we, we begin, she's already so broken. You know, Kate has had she she's been almost died because somebody cut sliced her her throat, and that affects her voice. And then it affects sort of she'll never pick up the guitar again because she mm -hmm. had played and had, now she can't sing. Yeah, and and seemed like she had a very rich, vibrant life, and then you know, decided to go into this work in Anchorage. And so when you get her at the beginning, I feel like she's already broken and that the journey, at least so far, is her continuing to step into her own, step up to the plate, and she heals. So she becomes more and more mature is, the, is I think, the, the wrong word, but she just expansive, more and more generous. And I think in the first book, she's broken and she's far less generous than what you would think 
within that you you know her heart is. Oh yeah, you know. I I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm, you know she's holed up on her father's homestead and she's not coming out. Mm-hmm. And it basically takes a stick of dynamite in the form of Jack Morgan to blow her out of mm-hmm. her redoubt. She's not going anywhere, and she's not doing anything. Her grandmother hasn't been able to get her out, but Jack is able to get her out. Yeah, and, and I wonder if it's Jack that's able to get her out or the fact that this this event occurred that was so devastating to her community. Mm-hmm. And she talks a lot about that in the first, I guess, I, I can't remember if it's the first or second book, but she talks a lot about um, really feeling as though it's somehow her, this is her family, this is her tribe, these are her people, and she doesn't really want to have to fix it, mm-hmm. but... She doesn't want to have to be responsible for anybody except herself right. in yet, the beginning. And and yet she keeps, she continues to People keep up. coming to her. And, yeah. People keep coming to her. It's like, oh, no. She hears a truck in the in the driveway, and it's like, oh, no. Or, what, or no, a chopper. <laughs> yeah, or, yes, yeah, or a chopper, yes, you're quite right, in a fatal thaw, yes. The I, god in the machine lands in the yard. But is it, I don't, I think it, I don't know which book it is where, where Kate is described and... Um, you get the sense she's not very big, and um, but there's a, a sort of ferocity to her, which, you know, people sort of are a little wary. And then also the mythology of Kate, which it, at Bernie's Roadhouse, you know, if she was involved in something that it just gets oh, more and more overblown. So they've really put so much energy into who she is and trust into who she is as a person. 